So let's get to the next part. Uh, and I would like to introduce the topic we are going to cover in this lesson um, by reading a stanza from one of my favorite poems, uh, which is entitled The Raven by Alan Edgar Poe. And the silk and sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to steal the beating of my heart I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this it is and nothing more. So we can definitely notice the repetition of the consonant sounds in this stanza to create a certain uh, atmosphere, right? So that the reader feels the tension, the fear um, the character experiences. And the s sound is repeated and the f sound is repeated so these are consonants and you see with the help of consonants you can create a certain atmosphere so we are going to deal with consonants and before uh, trying to understand what a consonant is let us remember what a vowel is so we Mm. Analyze this definition, right? Um, Daniel Jones says that a vowel is a voiced sound informing which the air issues a continuous stream through the pharynx and mouth, there being no obstruction and no narrowing, such as would cause audible friction. Thus, we can conclude that. Quite the opposite is happening when pronouncing a consonant. And actually, what would happen to the airflow? The airflow would meet a kind of obstruction, closure, barrier, and that is how, and then uh, it will be released in various ways. And this is how a consonant sound is produced. So uh, we can describe a consonant sound taking into consideration the activity of the vocal cords, and thus we have voiced or unvoiced sounds, the position of the soft palate, and thus we have oral or nasal uh, consonant sounds, the place of articulation, the manner of articulation and the force of articulation. And we can have 40 solenes consonant sounds. Now, when it comes to the activity of the vocal cords, here we have a picture. What do you think it is meant to represent? So actually, we can ourselves understand or whether a consonant is voiced or unvoiced. Uh, by the way, unvoiced is also uh, another way of calling is voiceless. So uh, we can decide whether a consonant is a voiced or unvoiced by simply putting our hand here, right? And pronounce the sound. So let's take, for example, the sound B. Okay, what's happening here? Do you feel anything? And then pronounce the sound p. B, b, b. Can you feel the difference? Okay, so we can fill in the um, space here with the appropriate word. If the vocal cords vibrate, the voiced sounds are produced. If they don't vibrate, then the unvoiced sounds are produced. And mm, these are the voiced sounds, consonant sounds in English, and these are the unvoiced consonant sounds in English. Now let's get to the position of the soft palate. Okay, if um, the soft palate is raised, the air escapes through the mouth, producing oral sounds. If it is lowered, the air escapes through the nose, 
as in the case of nasal sounds. And these are the three nasal sounds in English. Now, what is to be said concerning the place of articulation? Quite a lot, actually. So, um, if the two lips are the main articulators, then we have a bilabial sound. Uh, if the lower lip articulates with the upper teeth, then we have a labiodental sound. Uh, if the tip of the tongue articulates with the upper teeth, or it is placed between the teeth, we have a dental sound. Um, when the tip of the tongue articulates with the alveolar reach, we've got an alveolar consonant. The tip of the tongue articulates with the alveolar ridge and at the same time the front of the tongue is raised towards the heart palate. In this case, a palatal alveolar sound is articulated. The front of the tongue articulates with the heart palate, that would be a palatal sound. The back of the tongue articulates with the soft palate and we will have a velar sound. And finally, um, a sound produced in the glottis by narrowing of the passage, we have a glottal sound. Okay, now let's have a look. What are the bilabial sounds? Labiodental, dental, alveolar, palatal, alveolar, palatal, velar, and glottal. Okay. So, p, b, and m are bilabial. Pay attention what happens to the lips. Both lips are involved. Okay, f, v, right? F, v. The lower lip with the upper teeth. Dental, f, v, f, v. The tip of the tongue with the upper teeth, or the tip of the tongue can be placed between the teeth. Alveolar. Um, these are quite problematic sounds for some of um, the learners, so I'm sharing this from my experience. T, D, S, Z, N, L. So what's happening, right? T, 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 t. The blade of the tongue touches the alveolar region. Palate alveolar. Ch. J, sh, j, r. Palatal, i. Vala, k, g, w, n. And finally, which is a glottal sound in English. Okay, now what can be said about the manner of articulation? Actually, here we are going to point to that particular abstraction which. Um, um, does not allow the air for the airflow to pass um, uh, unobstructedly uh, through the vocal tract. So the abstraction uh, is made by the organs of speech to produce sounds, and this abstraction is made. It can be total, intermittent, partial, or maybe a narrowing causing a friction. So what kind of abstraction do you think happens here? Um, this picture is meant to represent the plosives in English, also called stops. And uh, there is a complete closure uh, in the vocal tract. The area behind this Barry abstraction uh, is pressed and then um, as a result of parting of the organs, the air is released suddenly with a kind of explosion. Think about p, b, right? You can even feel how the air is pressed and then suddenly released. Okay. Okay, what about this picture? What is it meant to represent? So it is meant to represent the affricate in English. There is a complete closure somewhere in the mouth and the soft palate is raised. Air pressure increases behind the closure and then it is released more slowly than in plosives. 
Okay. Now, what about this picture? Uh, it is meant to represent um, the fricatives in English. Again, we have a complete closure, but it is released slowly, leaving a narrow space for the air to escape, and we can hear the friction. Okay, then nose. Okay, the nasal sounds in English. So, um, complete, complete closure at some point in the mouth. The soft palate this time is lowered and the air escapes through the nose. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now um, what kind of uh, raises are these? Okay, these are lateral raises and uh, there are lateral consonant sounds. A partial closure is made by the blade of the tongue against the alveolar ridge and the air is able to flow around the sides of the tongue. L okay, and oh, what about this picture? Um, this is how I decided to um, introduce the approximants in English. And uh, this is when one articulator moves close to another, but not close enough to cause friction or to stop the airflow. And there are three approximants in English, um, R, and then we have E and W, which are actually semi-vowels. We'll get to that as well. Now, let's see the force of articulation. What do we have here? So um, consonants, right, are distinguished by the presence or absence of voice. Remember, we have voice, unvoiced consonants. And also the degree of breath and muscular effort implied in their articulation. The voiced consonants are produced with a relatively weak energy. So that's why they are called lenis. Pay attention, lenis consonants are voiced consonants. The unvoiced consonants um, require a relatively strong energy and they are named fortis. And this is how we can represent the fortis consonant, right? Effort, muscular effort needed. And the lenis consonant were actually no muscular energy, not no, but not that much muscular energy required. Okay, now let's discover um, each set of consonant consonants separately. We will uh, just um, take into consideration, we will group them according to the manner of articulation and describe their main features, spelling, uh, and how to properly articulate them.